Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so normally we would post a video on the boys today, but because of the fact that the Black Widow trailer dropped, I thought we'd do a video explaining Red Guardian uh, because a lot of people are kind of curious about him. Here's a funny thing about Red Guardian being introduced in the MCU. This is the first thing I thought when he popped up. I was like, okay, so why are we gonna introduce a character who basically had like a two-part story arc and then died and then came back as a life model decoy? Like, why would they introduce him? I would say it's not really because of Red Guardian. Like, I mean, he's there as a plot device. I would say the bigger thing here is that it can lead to the introduction of Colossus in the X-Men and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so We'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But for Red Guardian himself, he debuted back in uh, Avengers issue number 43 in 1967, and he was created by Roy Thomas. Now, a little bit of history here. Roy Thomas was kind of like the next big writer after Stan Lee. And the reason for that is because while Stan Lee and Jack Kirby are in a lot of ways considered to be the kind of one-two punch of comic books, and so far as a lot of the work that the two of them put in, including uh, Steve Ditko in the early days of Marvel, introducing like Thor and Iron Man, Spider-Man, returning Captain America to the landscape. Of course, he was originally created by Jack Kirby and, and Joe Simon, bringing in a lot of these major heroes here. Characters like uh, Natasha Romanoff, like Black Widow, while she was created by Stan Lee and Don Heck, it was one of these things where it was coming at a point where Stan Lee was being removed as a position of just a standard writer and being promoted to editor-in-chief. And so because of that, when it came to him basically leaving the writing duties, somebody else had to take over. And for the most part, you had Roy Thomas who had really earned his bones, you know, as part of uh, the old Charlton comics from back in the day, which ultimately a lot of those characters like Blue Beetle from the Charlton comics were, were taken over by DC and rolled into their lineup, uh, but he basically made his bones as a writer who knew what he was doing. And so when he came on board, he basically became the new Stan Lee insofar as he was writing pretty much everything in Marvel at the time in some form or another. There really hasn't been a title outside of maybe Spider-Man that Roy Thomas has not either written or had some kind of involvement in crafting regarding the various stories that existed really between uh, the late 1960s going into the, the early to mid 1970s and the 1980s. And so with that being the case, when Thomas came on and Stan Lee left, uh, Thomas basically looked at like the entire land landscape of Marvel as it existed and said, okay, here's one of the biggest issues that we have here is you've got a lot of plot threads that have been left hanging, especially with characters like Black Widow. Natasha Romanoff appeared back in Tales of Suspense number 52. Of course, she was created by Stan Lee and Don Heck, but for the most part, nobody knew anything about her. And so the idea was to basically flesh out her backstory, if only just a little bit, test the waters and see how people responded. And so the best way to do that was not to simply just introduce a character and call it a day. It was introduce a character, drive interest, and see if, see if people responded accordingly. And so Red Guardian was basically brought in as this guy named Alexei, who was essentially the Russian government's response to Captain America and the Avengers. And the reason for this was because in the aftermath of World War II, much like the real world, it turned into like this kind of Cold War, right? Where you basically had the United States and Russia engaging in a Cold War because they never actually fought with each other. Instead, it was a, pro a series of proxy conflicts, right? For those of you guys who aren't familiar with this, when it came to the Cold War, right? Like, like you know, kind of deviating away from comics for a second and talking about the real world. When it came to the Cold War, it was like the Soviet-Afghan War of the 1980s, the Korean War, the, the Vietnam War. These were conflicts where by the United States and Russia were kind of engaging in, in a, a war of sorts to try to spread their own spheres of influence, right? So the United States and capitalism versus Russia and communism. Uh, and so you ended up seeing like these kind of small conflicts. And the comics, it was designed to reflect that, right? Because back during the 1960s and 70s, uh, comics reflected the real world. Of course, when Franklin Richards was born, all that stopped. And that's the reason why you see a lot of people giving credence to the idea that Franklin Richards controls the Marvel Universe. Because once this character was introduced, it coincided with Marvel introducing the idea that they would never actually reflect the real world. Instead, they would try to make their comics uh, comics timeless by never actually telling you when events take place. And so because of that, what you ended up getting was uh, was the Russian government sitting down and saying, well, if the United States has the Avengers and Captain America, then we need something comparable. And so Alexei, who was a decorated pilot and married to Natasha Romanoff at the time, uh, was basically taken by, by the Russian KGB. Uh, and then he in turn was inducted into the Red Guardian program as its second iteration. Uh, Natasha Romanoff was told her husband died. And so the result of that is it allowed Roy Thomas to kind of focus on her character and basically bring her closer and eventually join the, the Avengers, as well as rescuing Wolverine and eventually starting a relationship or a romantic relationship with Hawkeye. And so following this, this led into really kind of a, a bit of a crossover, not a massive one, but a bit of a crossover insofar as that it involved really Avengers issue number 41, as well as Roy Thomas's final issue on uh, Strange Tales with issue number 159 that involved S.H.I.E.L.D. basically discovering the fact that the Chinese government had intended to use a device called the Psychotron, which could induce mass hallucinations, and then in turn use that as a means to either dominate the world or to create 
corrupt the superheroes, whatever the case wanted to be. And so in turn, they dispatched Natasha Romanoff as to, you know, to be basically be a spy for the Russian government to essentially monitor what it was that China was doing. At the same time, the Avengers were dispatched as well in order to deal with the threat. And then of course, Red Guardian as part of the Russian government was sent to, to intervene and to see what it was, what the potential was in terms of practical applications for the Psychotron if it was taken by the Russian government and used for their own ends. And so over the course of, of Strange Tales 159 and then Avengers issues 41, 42, 43, and 44, you basically had this story play out whereby Natasha Romanoff learned her husband was alive, albeit in a far more uh, ruthless state insofar as the KGB training had basically kind of brainwashed him to a degree. And so his only real desire was to demonstrate that he was better than Captain America. And then at the same time, having him face off against Captain America temporarily. Now the battle between Red Guardian and Cap was pretty short lived insofar as what ended up happening was Colonel Ling, who was the one that was overseeing the Psychotron project, uh, intended to kill Captain America. And so Red Guardian intervened because he deemed it to be a cowardly thing, which fell in line somewhat with the uh, with the Russian ideology of strength. And this basically led to uh, Red Guardian sacrificing his life, or at least believing to have sacrificed his life, uh, along with killing General Ling, and then ultimately Captain America, the Avengers, and Black Widow escaping. But following this, there were a couple of attempts by Marvel over the years to kind of reinvigorate interest in the Red Guardian concept. Now, there was a guy named Joseph Pitkus who basically became the new Red Guardian as part of the Winter Guard. But in terms of just Alexei himself, there were a couple instances where he showed up as a life model decoy, which is to say uh, basically a robot that looks, walks, and talks exactly like the original version, right? So in Marvel Comics, those of you guys who don't know, uh, in Marvel Comics, life model decoys, well, really, they're most commonly used by Nick Fury. But life model decoys are exceedingly capable. And in fact, not even really Wolverine can tell the difference between a life model decoy and a regular person. Uh, depending on who's writing the story, sometimes you can. It really just kind of fluctuates and, and bounces around based on, on what, what they're doing. Uh, but again, like for Alexi, he kind of popped up here and there. Not a whole lot came of it. Uh, in Daredevil Volume 2, issue number 64 in 2004 by Brian Michael Bendis, there was a story that involved the return of Alexi. Ultimately, he was captured. Uh, but it was basically this whole great big huge scenario where he, you know, set up this, this crazy situation that led to him and, and Black Widow being reunited, or at least Black Widow being aware of the fact that he was alive. Um, I don't really think any explanation was given in terms of how how he lived, uh, but ultimately he was there and then eventually taken into custody. He did become the newest iteration of Ronan, but nothing really came out of Alexi after the, the little mini series by Roy Thomas. He was just kind of a guy who's there. And so again, sort of getting into this discussion about the idea of, of why he's even in the MCU in the first place, under normal circumstances, I mean, most likely he'll be a character who'll die. There's really no reason to keep him there, especially because of the fact that the way he's depicted, he's aging, he's he's fat. Uh, he really can't be a comparable hero in any real means. Likely he'll die in the, in the, die in the film, but what's important is what can come out of the Red Guardian. And so the idea behind this, and this is something important to bear in mind, is that in Russia, what you had was a team called the Winter Guard. And the Winter Guard was basically Russia's attempt to create their own version of the Avengers. Now, eventually characters like Crimson Dynamo would go on to join the, the Winter Guard, but before it was officially formed, Russia basically started traveling around their own country and grabbing various individuals who had powers that could, that could be brainwashed or co-opted into the Winter Guard program and then forced to fight on behalf of the Russian government. One of the individuals who was attempted to, or I guess whose capture was attempted by the Russians was Colossus. And the idea was that at the time, uh, Charles Xavier had basically, he was in the process of forming a new X-Men team in response to the capture of the original X-Men by the mutant island of Krakoa. And so traveling to various iterations with giant size X-Men number one, it was really just a, a way for Marvel to introduce a more diverse X-Men team, but traveling around to different locations, going to Africa, recruiting Storm, going to Japan, recruiting Sunfire, uh, they, he ended up traveling to Russia and actually arrived at the home of Colossus right at the time when he was being cornered and confronted by Russian agents who were ultimately going to kidnap him and then kind of brainwash him in the KGB program and ultimately lead to him becoming uh, at least, you know, whatever role he was going to take on in the Winter Guard. Xavier intercepted and then basically saved the life of Colossus and then in turn asked him to join the X-Men, which Colossus did. But that's the reason why this is so important is because I wouldn't really say that Red Guardian is significant in and of himself. He's just a character who's there. I mean, what, what really matters and what really comes out of this is what Marvel can do, what the Marvel Cinematic U uh, Universe can do with their own iteration of that, right? Like introducing the Winter Guard, introducing the idea of, of like, you know, expanding on Black Widow's own story, right? Because Black Widow and, and really like her father worked with Wolverine for a time. Black Widow was trained in various ways by the Winter Soldier, although given the given the movie Captain America, the Winter Soldier, it doesn't really look like the, the two of them have had any real history together outside of the fact that he shot her at one point in time. But I would say the biggest thing about this is that this could essentially set the stage for small introductions here and there, right? Like you basically get a post credit scene where Russia's like, okay, so like the Red Guardian died, but like we should reboot the program, right? Because like there's no more Captain America in the United States, no more Steve Rogers, you've got Sam Wilson, but he doesn't really have any powers. So let's create our own version of Captain America. We're like, well, what are we going to call the team? We're going to call them the Winter Guard. Go forward and capture people. And the first thing they do is they show up on the on the doorstep of Colossus and the camera pans away to a mailbox that says like Rasputin. 
or something like that. You know, whatever the case is, you know, there, there's a lot of things that, that can really come out of this. But for Alexei himself, for the Red Guardian, he's by no means a significant character. He's not going to change the landscape of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The game doesn't shift because he's in this movie now. Uh, it's just kind of a character who's there who never had any real significance in Marvel Comics. <laughs> And really kind of begs the question for those of us who are familiar with Marvel, why is he even in the movie in the first place? <laughs> But again, you know, I say it's just setting the stage for much bigger things to come later on down the line. But I know this is a much shorter video than we normally do with uh, with the, the Explained series, but you're talking about a character who appeared in like two issues, so that's really all there is to it. Uh, but with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.